I have with me today the Acting Prime Minister, Minister Colum Imbert, and himself and I will address you all today, and I will start. I am pleased to announce that Cabinet today took a decision, and we both approved and confirmed the decision with respect to the Montrose Vidic Primary School. As you all would be aware, this has been within recent times quite a source of contention, and unfortunately, the children at the Montrose Vidic Primary School were complaining for a while now about itching and, 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 and scratching and, and being uncomfortable in the school environment, mm -hmm. and it does not seem to have been any permanent solution to this uncomfortableness of the children. We were quite shocked at Cabinet today, and as you would know, it is constantly raised in the Parliament by those in opposition and saying that nothing was being done to address the situation, etc. As soon as the Minister of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries was informed of this towards the end of last year officially for the first time and then received correspondence in February of this year, he immediately brought a note to Cabinet which was approved and confirmed today. Cabinet has today taken a decision to grant a parcel of land, 1.384 hectare acres, to the Vidic, the Vidic um, Primary School for them to relocate. So as soon as he was notified, he, he has rectified the situation. What was extremely surprising to us at Cabinet is the length of time that this problem has been known. So what was placed before us today is a factual scenario that in October 2011 was the first time that the Vedic people actually wrote to the Commissioner of State Lands requesting an alternative parcel of land for them to build a new school on. October 17, 2011. What is then even more shocking is that in November 2011, on November 21st, 2011, the Commissioner of State Lands advised the Vedic organization that requests for state lands for the establishment of schools should be recommended and fully endorsed by the Ministry of Education. And then between November 2011 and June 2015, there were several exchanges between the Commissioner of State Lands and this organization after they had been informed that they needed the endorsement of the Ministry of Education. What then happened sometime in between, on October 17, 2013, the Land Settlement Agency actually wrote to the Ministry of Education. I repeat that date, October 17, 2013, the Land Settlement Agency wrote to the Ministry of Education advising that they had reserved two sites in Felicity 2 for the primary school, one comprising 1.384 hectare acres and another one 1 1.13 hectare acres. So you have the Ministry of Education being informed in October 2013 that there were two proposed sites that could be granted to the Vedic body. This was quite shocking to us as a cabinet because leading the charge in the parliament on this issue has been those who were in power between 2010 and 2015, and all of these dates fall within that timeline and that time frame. Coming in as an administration, the Ministry of Education had been focusing on trying to eliminate this problem of, of the uncomfortableness of the children. Unfortunately, they were not able to. And as I say, today, cabinet, this cabinet has taken a decision to grant a lease to the, this, the body, the Montrose Vidic Primary School, mm -hmm. it's an institutional lease for them to construct a new primary school. So hopefully that problem will be resolved. But what was quite upsetting, I have to use that language, is that this problem was known since 2011. The public servants in the Land Settlement Agency, the Commissioner of State Lands, had identified two parcels of land since 2013 that could have been granted. It's only when the Minister of Agriculture was notified of this in December, he asked them to write to him officially and provide the documentation. And immediately upon receipt, at the end, towards the middle and end of February, he brought this note to Cabinet within a couple of weeks. And we have today on the first go approved and confirmed it. So I'm quite pleased that we were able to do that. 
Another issue I'd like to raise, because a number of members of the media have reached out to me on it, is the U.S. travel advisory. I'd like to start by saying that, yes, there was a U.S. travel advisory published within, I think, it's the last 24 hours that has been observed by persons. When the media first contacted me about it, I immediately responded saying, go and do a comparative analysis between this media, this travel advisory to U.S. citizens and the last travel advisory. Members of the media who did that then responded to me saying, you're right, there has been no substantial change. I then contacted the U.S. government and they told me the only changes in language were stylistic changes. There has been no change in the U.S. travel advisory system. In fact, I made this point during the carnival period that it was a good endorsement of all that we had been doing at national security, that none of our foreign ally countries in issuing travel advisories had changed it on us. The U.S. travel advisory that has recently published does not increase any threat level or any, any concern about criminal activity compared to the last one. And I can tell you that this morning, I've engaged our US, the U.S. Embassy here in Trinidad in Port of Spain and told them that I'd like the message sent back to the U.S. government in Washington that we want to relook some of the language in there, in particular the language with respect to terrorist attacks, etc., which were the previously employed in the travel advisory last year when we were facing a completely different period of time. And that is going to happen, so we've begun the engagement process of revising it in a downward position, hopefully. But the point that I'd like to make is all of those fear mongers out there, all of those persons trying to create some sense of panic, some sense of distortion of truth, some sense of distortion of reality, there has been no upgrade in the travel advisory with respect to any threat analysis for Trinidad and Tobago by our U.S. partners. The last, the penultimate issue I'd like to deal with is with respect to the Forensic Science Center. So I've also been contacted with what is going on at the Forensic Science Center. Yesterday, I was informed by the Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of National Security that our pathologist, our resident pathologist there, had indicated that he was unable to perform any more, any more um, pathologies and any more autopsies while he's under his for a specific period of time. Immediately upon us being informed of this, we have located another pathologist. I signed the note for him yesterday to be employed at the Ministry of National Security to come on board and to supplement and augment the resources we have at the Forensic Science Center. So yes, there is a current issue, and autopsies are not currently being performed, but we expect that to be resolved, I'm hoping, within the next 24 hours, with the retaining, and I was quite pleased to find out that at the North, I believe it's the North Central Regional Health Authority, there was another pathologist who had been employed by them, and we at National Security are now moving to employ that person and get him on board immediately, an Indian national. Two weeks ago in my conversations with the UN resident coordinator and other persons who flew down from New York at the UN, I reminded them of their commitment through the UNDP to assist us with finding more pathologists because I'm determined that during this period of time, this term, we will get more forensic pathologists on board to assist so these types of incidents don't happen. So I'd like to take the opportunity to apologize profusely to all of the families who are being affected by the lack of autopsies currently being conducted at the Forensic Science Center. Unfortunately, an issue arose that was an unforeseen one. We were working to resolve it, and in the meantime, what we did is we went and found another option, another pathologist, and we're bringing that person on board as quickly as we possibly can. The last issue I'd like to deal with, and I had a press conference with respect to it yesterday with the heads of division in national security in particular, our acting chief of defense staff, as well as our commissioner of police and our acting DCP, um, Dul Chan, our commissioner of police, Mr. Griffith, and our acting chief of defense staff, Group Captain Daniel. The success from a national security point of view of the carnival period, the statistics bear it out. As the commissioner said, and as I shared, we are working towards improving 
upon what we were able to do over the last carnival period, Monday and Tuesday of this week. What I'd like to notify the population about is yesterday, I had a meeting with all of the heads of security, and one of the items on the agenda was for us to do a post-mortem of the carnival period, find the areas where we can improve on, and that is exactly what I've asked them to do. I've asked them to produce a document that triggers all and, and, and records all of our discussions yesterday, all of the various areas that maybe we can improve upon. There's always room for improvement. And right after the Lenten period, I've told them we will hold a meeting with stakeholders to begin the discussions and the planning for Carnival next year to ensure that we better the security and safety of Carnival next year. I'd like to thank the heads of division who walked with me on Tuesday. You all would notice if you go back and look at the records, for a long time, the heads of prison services and the heads of the fire services were not part of that Carnival Tuesday walk, which is really to walk through and to make sure things are going well, but also to send a sense of security and comfort to the citizens. Upon coming into office, I ask that they be invited because one of the tenants that I've been pushing as the Minister of National Security are is the interagency approach. And I wanted that reflected even as we went out on the Carnival Tuesday. And we are seeing at national security level the benefits of this interagency approach and having all of the various arms of national security working together, sharing intelligence, doing operations together, etc. I'd just like to put the population on alert for two things that I intend to discuss with stakeholders and also then seek the approval of my cabinet colleagues for that I'm looking at having implemented for Carnival 2020. And there's no better time than to put the population on alert now. The first is I intend to ban all glass bottles for the Monday and Tuesday of Carnival. And I may even ask that the Cabinet approve the banning of glass bottles in public places, definitely for Monday and Tuesday, but also at Carnival parties prior to Monday and Tuesday for Carnival 2020. Unfortunately, when Carnival was brought to an ad abrupt stop on Monday, Tuesday afternoon on R. Peter Avenue, it was related. Part of the problem were the glass bottles that had accumulated. From a security point of view, this is a debate I had prior to Carnival. Unfortunately, the decision was not taken prior to this Carnival, but I'm putting the population on alert. I intend to ban glass bottles next year. Because we are able to lock down, as we did, for example, before Juve, all of the arteries coming into, for example, Port of Spain, and to stop and search persons to make sure knives and other dangerous weapons don't come in. But think about the accumulation of bottles, in particular on a carnival Tuesday from early in the morning along the streets, and these bottles just being dumped there. Yes, some are picked up, but there are a lot of glass bottles that are not. Persons are intoxicated over the whole period of carnival Tuesday, they then tend to use these bottles as weapons. As you heard the Commissioner of Police say, the criminal element descended on Arapita Avenue. Fortunately, due to our prior planning, our intelligence, etc., we were able to quickly avert it, lock it down. The Commissioner took a decision to shut off the music, and then we were able to move the criminal elements on. Why we were not able to necessarily apprehend those who were involved in this criminal activity is because by then it was very dark, it was difficult to identify exactly who were engaging in this, but there were some persons who began throwing bottles and using these glass bottles. So for Carnival 2020, prepare yourselves for the banning of glass, glass bottles. Another issue that I intend to take to Cabinet and that I intend for us to discuss with stakeholders within the next 40 days is the shortening of the proclamation for the Carnival period. There is no need in our deliberations and in our consideration at national security for Carnival to go, the proclamation for Carnival to go all the way to midnight on a Carnival Tuesday. As the national security forces say, in no other country in the world, including in Rio, Carnivals all across Europe, etc., do you have such an extended period of operations from Carnival Thursday, prior, the, the Thursday prior to Carnival, all the way to midnight on a Tuesday. So we're looking at what we were floating in our discussions yesterday as the heads of security is putting a shorter proclamation for Carnival to 9 p.m. on Carnival Tuesday night. No one will lose out. It provides for more safety and security. It assists us with traffic because one of the things we're always conscious of is getting people in and out of Port of Spain. 
back to their homes in a safe and secure manner. And if we close off at 9 o'clock on a Tuesday night of carnival, it just allows for more of that flow. Those three-hour periods will not be lost. And when we look at the statistics, that is actually where a lot of criminal activity takes place for a variety of reasons. So these are some of the things that we will be discussing with stakeholders. But I wanted to take the opportunity to tell the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, exactly as I said yesterday, even though we had a very safe, secure, and successful carnival from a national security point of view, we are not resting on our laurels or patting ourselves on the back. Immediately, we engage in a post-mortem, and we've begun to look at areas for improvement. And there are many more areas, but those are the two major ones I wanted to raise with you all today. And at this stage, I'll pass over to the Acting Prime Minister. Thank you. Good afternoon. Let me apologize for being on my phone. At the beginning, I was receiving information as Minister Young was speaking. Let me start first with the situation with the Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Rowley. Dr. Rowley underwent, as is accurately reported in newspapers, a series of tests yesterday in Los Angeles, and he expects to get those results today. Bear in mind that Los Angeles is four hours behind Trinidad and Tobago. So as we speak, it's not even nine o'clock in the morning yet in LA, so that I don't have an update yet with respect to the results of the tests that were done yesterday. But I expect to get that from Dr. Rowley, the Honorable Prime Minister, at some point in time. He is then going for a second batch of tests in another part of California on Saturday and a third set of tests on Monday. And what he's advised me is that after the results of the three sets of tests are in, then he will have a good idea of his situation. He's in good spirits, and uh, I think the country is hoping and praying for a uh, clean bill of health for the Prime Minister, and um, we hope and pray and wait for more information. So that's with respect to the situation with the Prime Minister. The next bit of information I'd like to give you, I, you may be aware that there was an incident with a Caribbean Airlines aircraft I have received a preliminary report, and what I was told is that at approximately 11.15 p.m. last night, an ATR aircraft was being taxied from the ramp at the airport to a hangar and came into contact with the wall of the terminal building and sustained some damage. The cause of the accident is not yet known. There could be many reasons for this, um, this accident, so that it would be premature at this point in time to venture speculation as to what caused the accident. There could be many reasons. What we do know is that the aircraft came into contact with the wall of the terminal building and suffered damage to its nose and other parts of the engine. The aircraft was not in service. There, was no, there were no passengers on board, and it was just being taken to the hangar for maintenance. The Civil Aviation Authority and Caribbean Airlines is, as I said, in the midst of a very in-depth investigation to determine exactly what transpired, and of course, also to assess the damage to the aircraft. It is expected that um, the aircraft will be out of service for about three months. Fortunately, before this, I had a visit from the Tobago House of Assembly would ask the Ministry of Finance to consider financing the wet lease of an additional ATR aircraft for the airbridge for the Easter season and the summer vacation. And uh, Caribbean Airlines had already reached quite far with this exercise. They are engaged in discussions with LIAT. LIAT has an aircraft that is available, similar aircraft to what Caribbean Airlines operates, similar ATR, ATR aircraft. So I've asked them to accelerate and finalize that arrangement, whether it is with LIAT or another provider, so that the AirBridge will have its full complement of um, aircraft in the shortest possible time, and also the aircraft will be available for regional services that are done with the ATRs. This does not address the issue that the THA raised with me, because this is simply a substitution. So I've asked Caribbean Airlines to see whether we have to look at perhaps 
another aircraft for peak periods, but that will come, that information will come in in, in short order. But it is fortunate that by sheer happenstance, the THC had asked for the wet lease of another aircraft for Easter. And um, it is very fortunate that Caribbean Airlines has reached very far with the lease of that aircraft, which it should be able to bring on board before the end of this month. So that's the situation with the Caribbean Airlines aircraft. With respect to Carnival, unfortunately, we had, we had hoped that the Minister of Community Development could be here, but she's under the weather, a bit of a, a flu, so that I asked the Minister to give us some highlights of Carnival 2019. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. I am simply reporting <laughs> what the Minister has told me, that some of the highlights as far as the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts are concerned, is concerned is the introduction of the North Park. As far as the ministry is concerned, North Park was a more versatile venue than the North Stand because it was able to host multiple events in the same spot. Of course, a post-mortem would be done to see exactly what the positives or otherwise of the replacement of the North Stand with the North Park were. Brass Bacchanal, which was held on Monday night at the North Park, turned out to be a tremendous success. It's a return of brass to Carnival, and it was a good use of um, North Park, and they had a bumper turnout. The Soka Drome was included in the mass route for the first time in 2019, and I saw a report in the papers today, and I'm going to assume it's accurate, that the um, owners of the tribe family of bands financed the Soka Drome, and admission was free. So... I'm assuming that newspaper report is accurate. And if it was, then I don't think anybody should have anything to complain about with respect to the Soka Drome. And Soka Drome was utilized from early morning. I, in fact, saw that myself on television on Tuesday. The Manj saw a change of format, which eliminated the competitions and created a, a cultural show. There have been quite a few positive comments on that and some criticisms as well. The Ministry of Culture in particular wants to apologize to the Moko Jumbi king and queen not being able to take the stage and um, this will be investigated and corrected going forward. Panorama, as we all know, was very keenly contested uh, with um, this renegades Renegades winning again. I think they're now tied with All Stars, if my carnival memory records in my head are correct. I think they're now tied for 11 with um, Desperados. Desperados was the winner of the most panorama final competitions until 2019. So the three big bands came one, two, three. And I think everybody would say that the Panorama Final was a tremendous success. The junior events, the Calypso, Soka, Chutney Monarchs, School Pan, are growing. And um, the Honorable Prime Minister indicated that he had an opportunity to visit Junior Panorama. And he was really uh, surprised and pleased by the quality of the performances and the enthusiasm of the students. So this is something that we at the government level would certainly continue to support and promote the junior events at Carnival. Canboulet, I understand, had a sellout crowd. I was told that if you didn't get there by 4 o'clock for the Canboulet um, reenactment, you couldn't get standing room. And um, there were all different types of people there, locals and visitors alike. And I understand it was excellent, and I have that not just from what the Minister of Culture is telling me, but from people who actually went to the event. It's really um, a tremendous um, performance. And then, of course, we had the emergence of Caribbean artists in our mainstream competitions, um, taking the Soka Monarch and also part of the Road March, which is good for Caribbean integration. So... From all accounts, Carnival 2019, from a safety perspective, you heard the Minister of National Security. You've most certainly heard the ubiquitous Minister, um, Commissioner of Police, who was here, there, and everywhere. I don't know what um, exercise regimen he's on, but he had a lot of energy. He was all over the place. 
So Carnival was very safe in 2019, as we heard. Kudos to the police, kudos to the protective services, kudos to the Ministry of National Security. And from all accounts, there was tremendous participation in Carnival this year. It was a great success. There are issues, of course, that we have to look into, complaints from regional carnivals and so on we have to look in and formulate policy in terms of promoting the, the festival in all parts of Trinidad and Tobago. But those are things we will look at as a government. We have to get a proper, proper post-mortem on that. And finally, the last thing I would like to speak about is a matter involving a potential foreign investment by a Jamaican firm. This is NCB Jamaica who has made a takeover bid for Guardian Holdings of Trinidad. I'd like to clear the air. I'd like to say the government welcomes investment in Trinidad and Tobago, particularly from within the CARICOM region. And we are facilitating this takeover bid to the best of our ability. Uh, we are hopeful that all of the issues will be solved very soon, but we welcome this Jamaican investment in Trinidad as our businesses also go out to invest in the Caribbean, in Jamaica, and Barbados elsewhere. So that we are very supportive of this initiative by NCB of Jamaica. There are just some issues that need to be resolved. We must take this through all of its stages in terms of review. There are two issues that we are looking at, and that is um, the payment for the shares in terms of whether they should be paid for right away or whether they can be paid for by way of a loan from some of the shareholders. And the other issue we're looking at is the ownership of NCB, whether it is owned by a Jamaican entity or whether it's owned by Canadian entities. So we're looking at that in the context of, of the applicable laws. And we're also looking at the question of control, exactly who controls the company that is seeking to buy the shares, which is a Trinidadian registered company called NCB Global um, Holdings Limited. But we don't expect these things to create any major problems. We're in constant dialogue with the representatives for NCB of Jamaica, and we hope it will all be settled soon. And as I said, we welcome this investment. And once the applicable procedures are followed, we don't anticipate any difficulties with the investors. And um, and I'll hand you back to the Minister of Communications. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take a few questions, but just before we take a few questions, I was just glancing at my phone. As you all know, we don't have our phone in Cabinet, and so that with respect to the U.S. Travel Advisory, so I'm glad I provided that information, that once again the opposition is leading the charge with an attempt to mislead the population. And I'd like to publicly denounce this type of continued destructive behavior. As I said a short while ago, the U.S. Travel Advisory has not changed, so all attempts by the opposition and their use of social media, etc., to try and misinform the population, distort the truth and the reality, to tr try and create some sense of panic and a destructive mood over Trinidad and Tobago after we've just come out, as you heard the Honorable Acting Prime Minister say, a very enjoyable and safe carnival is rejected. We'll take whatever questions you all have at this stage. A few questions. Uh, Minister, the, the proposed ban mm -hmm. on bottles. Um, now, most alcohol is in glass bottles. So <clears throat> how would this ban, um, how do you hope to implement Achieve that? It. Is it that Angus to run these people? <coughs> are going to be required to make an adjustment to their... Well, as I said, I mean, that's why I'm starting the conversation now. And as I was very careful to say, we will be engaging with stakeholders to discuss this prior to and well in a year advance of the implementation for Carnival 2020. One of the things, what really it comes down to are the beer bottles. Because at the end of the day, the bigger alcohol in terms of the... The, the liquor, the hard liquor in the big bottles, that can be controlled because you can pour those into plastic cups, etc. So when we are done an analysis, it really comes down to the beer bottles. So presumably it would be engaging those who manufacture beer in Trinidad and Tobago or package it, etc. To tell them, look, well in advance of Carnival 2020, 
see if you can increase your, your packaging into cans, which happens everywhere. So these are some of the things that we will consult on with the stakeholders, but I'm putting everybody on notice now that from a security point of view, we intend to ban the bottles. We have a whole year to plan it and do it properly. And just let me come in here. There are many of the Carnival Fed promoters had already self instituted a self-imposed ban on bottles. Correct. And they, they have addressed the issues raised by UMA State and dealt with them successfully. The hard liquor, as the minister has pointed out, is poured into Styrotex cups. So, well, we, we don't really want Styrotex. Plastic, plastic cups <laughs> and, and, and the, the beer <coughs> in, in cans. So, it's, so as long as there's proper planning, this should not be a, a big issue. You sort of like the cool effects where you are allowed to bring in. No, but even with cool effects, yes, now they implement that the bot you're not allowed to bring glass bottles. Yes. So what I've seen people doing is actually getting gelitas and pouring the, the hard liquor into the gelitas and taking in those plastic bottles. You'll have enough advance warning. I mean, some of the success of the security measures you saw for Carnival this year were because we started planning months in advance. So we'll engage the stakeholders, we'll discuss it with them, and we will find the solutions for implementation. And in fact, the, the measure that the minister just mentioned has been enforced now at some feds for more than three years, yeah. where I've seen young people pouring <laughs> rum and scotch and so on into plastic bottles and going into feds with that because they're not allowed. And this is a cooler fed I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. They're not allowed to carry glass in. So with proper planning um, and cooperation, I'm sure it's something that would not create too much of an issue. Does this require legislation or you can just put out... It, it does require legislation. It's done via the carnival regulations. So I'd actually looked at it for this year, but we felt it was too late and too close to carnival for us to successfully implement it. And the idea would, of course, be to impose a fine on Correct. They will, but also what it does is allows our law enforcement officers, if they see this occurring, they can deal with it. Good afternoon, Minister. Um, the situation at the Forensic Science Center, um, is it that the resident pathologists had reached the threshold number? The, yes, the, the resident pathologist apparently came to his employer, National Security, within the last few days. His contract has absolutely nothing in it about any threshold. So I laugh because you've obviously been briefed by a certain party as to where this is coming from. So what, what it is, is there's nothing contractually that talks about a threshold. So the argument I understand to be being made is when you look internationally, there are certain thresholds, etc. So we're not, I'm not getting into a dispute or a battle with anyone if that's the position that they're taking. They're performing a service. What we went and did is we found an alternative solution, and that is currently being implemented. The reason why I asked you threshold thing is because this situation arose in the past with um, Dr. Alexandra, um, where he also had reached his threshold, etc., etc. But my question is that does it really have to reach this stage that pathologists can't perform and therefore the system is tiny? The answer from my perspective is no. So if I, as a lawyer, if I look at your contract and there's nothing that talks about, so for example, as a, a media personnel, there's nothing that talks about, well, you, in your contract, go and cover five events a day and then you turn around to your employer and say, well, look, you're asking me now to go to the sixth one. And the employer says, but there's nothing in your contract that talks about a threshold. So it came as a surprise. And whilst you say that Dr. Alexandrov may have raised it before, with this particular contract, that was the information provided to me. But as I say, I'm not getting into a dispute or fight with anyone. So we've gone, we found an alternative. I signed yesterday for that person to be employed, the terms of his contract of employment. My understanding, he's accepted, and I'm trying to get him on board immediately. So, um, well, my other question would have been when you expect it to be resolved and, of course, if there's a backlog and... I have asked that it be resolved when I was informed of this yesterday. We were supposed to try and get the person to start today, so I'm assuming if he doesn't start today, by tomorrow. And yes, I mean, if there's a backlog, the backlog has to be dealt with and it will be dealt with. In the meantime, I understand that some persons are inconvenienced and especially when it comes to the passing away of a relative. So my sympathy, my empathy goes out to them. And I'm really hoping that 
it will be resolved within the next 24 hours. Looking more into the threshold, the international threshold, if it does exist, so that, you know, if for an, a year on average we have 400 murders and a pathologist can only perform 100, then we would assume that we should have four maybe on staff. Absolutely, but remember with autopsies, they're not just for murders. So, so yes, the answer is yes. And I have been asking for, and this was even before, we have, as a cabinet have taken a decision to go to the experts. The UNDP have a program where they locate forensic pathologists from around the world who are willing to go to certain countries and do their work. We've engaged as soon as I came in and made sure the payments were made. Yesterday I asked them again, why hasn't this been done? Why hasn't it been achieved? So the answer obviously has to be, let's get more human capital, more human resources in it because it can't keep coming up this way over and over again. So I hold that same view and I've asked for it to be dealt with. Mr. Uh, Ingrid, um, Minister, with respect to the wet lease of the ATR, is there a cost attached? Do you have an average cost at this point? In I time? wouldn't have a cost yet, but um, the costs are standard. We've done this before. We've wet lease ATRs before so that Caribbean Airlines knows the framework that they have to operate in, and we will be leasing the aircraft from a provider. We will do it because we have to. I have a picture here of the damaged plane. So do I. I have many. It, it's considerable. I mean... Well, the nose of the aircraft is uh, not a structural element in the sense that it could withstand impact with a concrete wall so that you are going to see that kind of damage if the nose of an aircraft encounters a concrete wall. A aircraft is not designed to run into an immovable object. The, there's damage to the skin of the aircraft, the, the, the framing and so on. There may be damage to the radar and so on. I have some estimates of the cost, but these are very preliminary. It may cost about a million US dollars, but that's a very preliminary estimate I've received. And Caribbean Airlines is insured, and they will be applying to the insurance company to cover the cost of the accident, less the usual deductible that you would have in most insurance policies. But don't take me at that one million US damage. That's just a very preliminary estimate of the damage. Was the terminal, was the wall that, um, the uh, You know, someone else asked me that question. I'm afraid I don't have that information. But that part of the aircraft is quite soft. Eh? It's, there, there isn't much hard metal in that area because it's just a skin around the front of the aircraft. So there may not have been significant damage to the terminal, but I, I can't tell you. I'm sure that will be determined in due course. Mr. you mentioned the um, changing of the proclamation time. And you mentioned uh, noticing that into the 10, 11, 12, but within that, those hours and increasing crime. Um, well, any statistics um, you could provide or, or what was provided? I don't have any statistics with me. I mean, today, what you all heard yesterday was for the carnival period, the serious reported crimes, in particular with the Port of Spain area, we were down to 12, up from 40, in the 40s in 2014, 2015. But it's just known, as, as I was discussing, the commission and pol Commissioner of Police and myself were discussing at 6 o'clock this morning. I can speak from experience. So in the past, I know as someone who has participated, when it starts to get dark on a carnival Tuesday, the whole mood starts to change, etc., etc. So what they are looking at, and the police have the statistics, is that is when there seems to be a spike in criminal activity taking place and the use of bottles, etc. So the commissioner of police, his men and women, are very, very clear in our discussions yesterday, and I agree with them, that that carnival period, we, there is nothing lost by us reducing those three hours on a proclamation and stopping Carnival at 9 p.m. on a Carnival Tuesday, but a decision has not been taken. This is just our perspective from a security point of view, and I repeat, we will engage stakeholders in discussions, and that's one of the concepts we'll talk about. And I just want to make it clear, this would be a proposal coming from the Ministry of National Security to the Cabinet. The Cabinet will be the ultimate decision maker. But it, it does make sense. The time is something that the minister obviously will be looking at because you now have the feature of after parties 
in Carnival Bands. In fact, I was in Georgia, Fifth Park, Mandela Park. Mandela Park, let me say the, the name correctly. I was in Mandela Park on Tuesday night, and there was an after party there. I think the same tribe family of bands uh, had an enclosed area and had their music and so on. And I think they went a little past eight. I'm not sure if they went past nine. So this is something that needs to be discussed with the stakeholders. But certainly, the minister is absolutely right. I have been out at Carnival at midnight myself and seen, as he says, the mood does change and people come in. You, if you, if you had ever played mass, you would realize that the number of stormers in the band starts to increase in intensity from about 5.30, right. 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. Uncostumed masqueraders come into the band, well, uncostumed people come into the band and sort of take over the band. And then if you look at a carnival band at, say, 6.30 at night, half of the band is people who are not from the band. So it is something that needs to be discussed. It's a very, very serious matter, and I'm sure national security will discuss with all the stakeholders to arrive at a common position that is beneficial to everybody, bearing in mind the security issues that they have identified. Just the one security issue that hasn't been highlighted that the police raised with me yesterday is understand that they've been on patrol intensely from Monday morning and over the weekend as well. But those persons said that this year for the first time you saw an increase in the presence of uniformed officers along the various routes, etc. Those uniformed officers, after a while, they do get tired, etc. So when they've been going through that type of intensity for the 48-hour period, there does start to be a dip in their efficiency, etc. And also, we have to look after our officers, our law enforcement officers, and our protective services. And, and, well, just as you said, we have to but qualitatively. Are we saying is it, is it petty robbery or so? What types of crimes? Uh, what, the commissioner, what the commissioner indicated yesterday at the press conference is you had a lot of minor robberies. So persons starting to snatch jewelry, persons starting to pickpocket and these types of things. But that can quickly escalate to more serious crimes if someone resists, etc. So we just want to, as I say, have discussions with stakeholders. We work it out. There's nothing written in stone at this time, but what we're doing is giving a year's advance warning that these are two important initiatives we intend to have discussions on and hopefully move towards implementation for 2020. Do you find the juve period to, and I'm not suggesting mm -hmm. here that, but I'm saying similarly, um, people talk about crimes. Well, I can tell you, well, Juve has changed. The time of Juve, a decision was taken a few years ago to move the timing of Juve up closer to sunrise. That has made a tremendous difference. So I was out again with the Commission of Police at 6 o'clock on Monday morning. By then, the sun is full, you know, is up, and you're dealing in daylight, etc. And it makes it a lot easier to police, a lot easier from a security point of view. That small change made a tremendous difference in the safety of Carnival and in particular Juve. Minister Embiid, on another topic, we saw that the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank they recently launched a pilot for the digital EC dollar. Can we soon look forward to a digital TT dollar? No. It's not on the cards. Any reason behind that? Are you well, the cryptocurrency, blockchain technology, this is all very new. There are positives, but there are negatives. It's dangerous. It's the currency of choice of persons who illegal are involved activities. in illegal activities, so that it is not something that Trinidad and Tobago would be looking at at this time. I wish the Eastern Caribbean well in their experiment. Let's go back to Carnival. Our officers on patrol, are they equipped to take a report if a masquerade or a citizen makes a once make a report on the spot? I asked because there was an incident, at least one person outlined, where they had been physically harmed in some way in whatever band, and they were being told to walk a certain distance to the police station to meet the <coughs> The answer is, that's the first responder. So the first responder can provide a preliminary level of assistance. But in terms of taking a physical police report, the answer is no. You have to go to the closest police station. What we've been working with the police, you would know if anyone has had to make a police report, for example, in a road traffic accident or any other police report, they're now standardized forms that are quite 
well thought out forms and you have to fill those forms out and then those forms are then inputted into the computer system. So I don't think anywhere in the world, certainly that I have been, a police officer on the beat, as we call it, on the street, is in a position to take a police report. So whilst they may be able to secure you, look after you, etc., the police report, the reporting to the police always takes place in a police station. So they may tell you, look, come, come back to the police station, go to the police station. Uh, that, that's just how it's done because of the level of detail that is necessary for a, police re a report to the police. A comment, and I don't know if you found the same thing. But a tourist, well, a Trinidadian who's been overseas for a long time and came back, reported to me that this um, walking around for the Spain on the Saturday, children's carnival, that he heard people telling the police officers, you know, thank you for your service and, and statements like that, which was something that was very surprising to him. Um, have you had those kinds of reports? Absolutely. The answer is yes. So I can tell you personally, as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, any uniformed police officers I saw on the periods that I was out there, including Saturday night, last week, Sunday, or the previous Sunday for the, the children's, the school's panorama, etc. I made it a, a duty to tell them thank you. But I saw citizens doing that, especially on Carnival Monday and Tuesday. There just was a much more positive atmosphere. The, 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 the police service really did a tremendous job. In fact, as I was saying yesterday, and I'll repeat it here, immigration officers, the men and women in immigration office, customs as well, provided persons who were coming to Trinidad and Tobago with a different experience. I'd gone up before, last week, Tuesday, spoken to the immigration officers, reminded them they're the frontline officers. When people arrive, said, let's try and avoid the long lines. I want to give them a, a serious pat on their back and a thank you as a citizen and then as a minister for what they did. I also thank the lifeguards. Last night I saw circulating on the media lifeguards go into action at Maracas Beach yesterday during the cool long period and literally save a man's life. They are performing invaluable roles and sometimes are forgotten. So as a minister of national security, I commend them for being on duty and for the level at which they performed, and I thank them as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. Okay. One more question. One more question. Well, this is more clarity. You mentioned, you mentioned yes. there were two sides reserved the publicity in 2013. The powerful given now, is it that that's I believe it's one of them because it's the same 1.384 hectare acres. So one of them, yes. I can tell you where, where this parcel is going to be. It is on Henderson Street in Chagonas. And what they've actually, what the minister actually did, and it was approved by cabinet, is there's a nice empty piece of land next door, which they can use for playground facilities because the current school site, I'm told, is right next to the market and there's actually nowhere extensive or expansive for the children to play. During the period that this place is being constructed, are they going to be put in a Well, they've been there throughout. I mean, at the end of the day, I don't have those level of details as, you know, the Ministry of Education, the school, and, and this type of thing. What, what we sorted out at Cabinet today was leasing the land to them because this has been festering since 2011. 2011. So we put an end to that, and at least for this um, Vedic school was approved by Cabinet today. And the reason the cause of the change. Is that still undetermined? It, it appears so, yes. Okay, thank you all very much. Take care.